I became a freelancer by accident. Um, as we sat outside the office in the sunshine having lunch, a good friend and colleague of mine asked if I'd be interested in helping her with a project. She said she needed an illustrator who could argue over the finer points of stratigraphy. Sounds like fun, I said. I had no idea what I was letting myself in for. Mm -hmm. That was 10 years ago and the start of my freelance career. The project was to publish the excavation records of Raleigh Radford at Glastonbury Abbey from the 1950s and 60s. Last November, after nine years, the Society of Antiquaries published the monograph, which was AHRC funded. It looks at all the unpublished excavation records at the Abbey between 1904 and 1979. Initially, I worked on the project alongside my job in a commercial unit. Circumstances changed when my husband was headhunted from a job, for a job on the Isle of Wight. He's been headhunted a couple of times, and we've lived in Cambridge, and now in the Wicklow Mountains, about 45 minutes outside of Dublin. Telecommuting technology, mainly Skype and Dropbox, has made this nomadic existence possible. Currently, I work in both academic and commercial sectors of the profession. I do what you would expect from an illustrator in a commercial archaeological graphics department to do. Maps, plans, sections, map regressions, and find illustration. I work with GIS and survey data as geomatics and graphics move closer to each other, and with a pencil and calipers, as I still find it the best way to draw some difficult objects. The topic I'd like to outline for discussion is one I find misunderstood when it comes to the work of an illustrator. Artists' terms and conditions. Many of my peers use a copyright licence which was produced by the AINS in around 2002. This template contract covers aspects of copyright, intellectual property and contract law. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer. But I have spoken to one about this to check I'm getting my facts at least broadly straight. Generally, as an employee, all of your work and its associated intellectual property is the copyright of your employer and will be covered in a standard employment contract. As a freelancer, when you're commissioned to undertake a piece of work, unless you agree in writing beforehand, the work you produce is and remains your copyright. The AINS published a technical paper in 1984 covering this in detail. Although the legislation in it was superseded in 1988, I'm reliably informed that for a lay person, the explanation in the paper is still valid. For a photographer or a specialist report, there's generally a broad understanding of who holds copyright. As an illustrator is not an author, sometimes it's not appreciated in the same way. An illustrator's drawing derives from results in the same way a specialist report does. As an example, I once went to a talk and was delighted to see my drawings had been used. The problem was, the person using them wasn't the person I had drawn them for, and they hadn't credited me as illustrator. I spoke to them afterwards and asked them to cite me when they used my drawings. They were put out and said that, I'd been paid for them, so they weren't mine. It's one of the most common misconceptions, and it isn't about money. If I'm honest, I should have politely put them straight, but at that point, I didn't really know where I stood. It was implied that I ought to be flattered they'd used my drawings, rather than feeling a bit miffed that it had been made to look that my work was theirs. The law aside, it just felt like bad manners. The artist's terms and conditions, produced by the AINS, which are now around 13 years old, also cover the mechanics of delivering commissioned work. Timescales surrounding projects do no, not go on as planned. In fact, I'm currently working on a project which I quoted for in 2013. The document formalises exactly how to deal with project milestones. Digital delivery of drawings has changed this a bit, but the basis is still very useful. Although this is all very excellent in the theory, practice is a little different. Using the terms and conditions as you start a new business relationship is a great way to build trust between yourself and your client. 
It opens the door to informal discussions of things like interim invoicing if it does stall, or your project does stall. <coughs> With my long-standing clients, much of these processes become red tape and unnecessary. I'd like to finish with a little observation about art and its ownership. I used to commute to a non-archaeological job on the train and tube in London. Sometimes I'd bring my sketch pad and draw. When I did, almost without fail, people would peer over my shoulder, ask what I was doing and what I was drawing. I liked it, even when they critiqued it. Because as an illustrator, I want my images to be seen but I'd like you to know that I did them. I started out straight from university as an undergraduate, which I think is probably, I would not recommend it, but I knew when I finished, I wanted to do albums. I had quite a good bit of experience while I was at university and being 22, I knew everything. So I set up, for the HMRC, got myself a self-employed um, account set up and did some advertising and sat there and got another job. <laughs> and then eventually I, I got a few small bits of work through someone that had just noticed my advert in the IFA um, annual yearbook. Um, and from that, a few bits and pieces dribbled in, um, which were actually turn into more and more stuff. I realised that I needed to do um, postgraduate qualifications, so I've got my master's, um, I've since got my PhD, and now I teach in, at UCL, um, so archaeology. And that's taken um, about 20 years to happen. So um, what I would probably start off by saying is be prepared to diversify, and don't just think I'm going to do this job, this is what I really want to do, and that's all I'm going to do. I've worked selling, buying and selling engineering tools and being a delivery driver and doing all kinds of stuff. So just think there's, there's more to your startup than just doing that one job. Think of uh, supplementing your income with other things. I would just say that I've never, don't think I've ever made a living wage doing it. Um, even though I'm quite busy now, it's probably getting up to about that. But um, but I have managed to have a family um, a long way. So it's fitted in with what I wanted to do with my life perfectly. And I think I knew at the beginning that that was how it was going to work. I wanted a family and I wanted a job I could do from home. I wanted to do something I enjoy. And that's that's what I've done and I've been quite lucky to do that. So it's, it's a good thing to do if you know what you want to do. Working for yourself is a brilliant opportunity. And I think a lot of the ins and outs of being self employed have been covered and they're going to be covered further. So, what I want to um, just talk about very briefly are um, a couple of things. Firstly, to do with the feeling of isolation, um, which quite a lot of people um, suggest as they brought up. And, um, it can be a problem, but luckily in the zoology community, um, we've got um, online forums. So we've got a um, we've got the um, zoo group on, uh, which is a discussion group. And being both people, we're really happy to help each other. If anyone's got a problem, we can go on there with our question. People will get back to us if they know the answer. If not, they'll give suggestions. If you want. Um, a piece of uh, on a paper that you don't have because you've not got access to a university library, people will send you PDFs, or they'll, in the old days, they would send you paper copies of it. So, um, obviously, the um, zoo art were quite lucky with that. I know there's others that exist for the specialisms, um, but if you're starting out and you and there isn't a group like that for your specialism, you're probably not alone in not having one. So stop one up. That's my advice. And if you can't start one up um, by yourselves, ask the, um, the IFA, ask the CEPA, and they'll help, I'm sure, set things up. Because um, sharing your problems with like minded people <coughs> can be a bit um, unnerving at first because you're thinking, oh, people are going to think I don't know what I'm talking about. But there's going to be other people out there in that, in your same boat as you. 
and I'll probably think, oh, someone can ask a question, I can ask a question. In some areas it's not. I won't mention them. There's a certain group of uh, people that are similar to our folk specialists, and, and that wouldn't happen because, um, from what I've heard, they're a bit less sharing. Um, <laughs> there is, um, what else? So, flow of information as well. So, um, through the, there's also the PSHG, which is a professional zoo art group, which is set up through um, Historic England, is it now? Um, where <coughs> it's just for professional zoo archaeologists around the country. So we're not a massive group, but we get together twice a year, we catch up to see what projects people are doing. We tend to have a theme, so we can uh, it helps with our CPD, we can see what the most recent advances are in that area. Um, and again, if there's not one of your discipline, if there's not a little networking group of people that get together, set one up. It's a really, really beneficial thing. It's only been there for 10 years. And it's been really, really useful, especially for teachers that are self-employed. It's meant for people like that. And it also brings them together with people that are at um, universities, um, which is really useful. So you get the contacts, and you can go and use the reference collection, and you can go and use the university libraries. There's always people you can draw on just to say, I can't get this reference, can anybody else pass on the PDF? Um, and then, of course, the internet, there's things like phone comments, other, other sites out there where people share data through into our and it is really helpful so if you're starting out look and see what's out there and then don't be afraid of asking for help or putting questions out there if you really don't mind um, and this leads me on to another thing that i'm starting to really get a bit annoyed about mm -hmm. the, the way things are going in in archaeology i'm sure everyone has realized is that it's getting more discursive so the specialist reports are all getting lumped at the back of the volume in an archive, and most of the, the of what you're saying is getting put into a discussion um, by the editor. Um, sometimes you'll get, a, you'll get a brief bit of uh, things, but things are moving on from the old-fashioned way of doing it, where you've got your bit about the site, and then you've got a specialist report, and then you've got a summary at the end. It's getting more discursive. And so I think as, a, as specialists, we should be one a separate one step ahead of the game, and we should start to ask for interdisciplinary um, forums, maybe. I've started, when I quote for a job, um, or when I do an assessment, I will put at the bottom of my recommendations, it would be great if towards the end of this project was a write-up, if um, the specialists could get together to talk about what's going on, especially on complex sites, if it's, if it's not that complex or the assemblies aren't that big, whatever. But on rich sites where there's obviously a lot going on, we should be sharing the data. We should be more um, integrated. And I think we can learn a lot. And, and the site narrative, the story we can tell can be so much better if we just talk to each other. And I think maybe CIFA could facilitate this. They could perhaps set up a, a forum or, or a way that we could link Together, the different aspects, the different specialisms within the site, so there's a much better understanding of what's going on there. It's obviously just me going off on a tangent, but I think as specialists, it's something we should start, and self employed people, we should start doing because this is what we've lost by going out of the unit. So, because we're not within a unit anymore, <coughs> we lose that talking around the water cooler. We don't get to talk to the specialists about what's happening in this pit where I've got these. I've got all these uh, deer around or whatever, and they say, oh, the archaeological people, oh, my God, there's a haze in the show. And me, um, sorry, I can't say, but all these whole complete pots, and it's like, well, that's amazing. Go off with it. If you don't get that, I'll just say, I've got a load of deer rats in this, and they might be using them for tool making or whatever. So it can be really helpful. And I think the last thing I want to say is about publishing things that you find in your work that's interesting. Um, because you will find things that are interesting, and they might not get picked up on it, but <coughs> in a small grey little report, you know, it's <coughs> um, So you can publish your own stuff on Oasis. Um, as long as you reference the, the, the wider project it's part of, and I really recommend that. I'm just starting to do it. It's, it's get training on it but it's a good way of, of getting it out there and people can um you can reference it so people can go and find it 
you can. I've published a few things separately that are of interest in assemblages. And um, the, the commissioning unit, I've not had a problem. Someone should ask them and say, um, I think this would be good as a standalone report. Do you mind if I write it up in a bit more detail? And they, they tend to be quite happy for you to do that. Obviously, you're plugging them as well because you're putting in the introduction of how great it was and deciding what was plugged by so and so in a really great way. And then, thank you so much. So, you just think it should go off a bit more. Um, so, never be scared of, of saying, I've done this work, I think it needs to be out there to my practice. Other people find useful. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is um, sorry. <laughs> oh, the penalties are rather low. Right. My name is uh, Stephanie Rappai. I don't need to have come back to check what I'm from. We know that much. My story is a bit like alcoholics and all that. Not the time I've I started up. Not as an archaeologist, and I, I do not have an archaeology degree. And um, I, but I went out and still live with a man who's an archaeologist. So I started going to this, and I don't just archaeology. Um, and um, so I have various different bits of practical experience. Um, and then I was involved with an MSc schemes, which. Uh, those of you under the age of about 45, you might remember what you found. Um, but that was very useful for me because I, I did a lot of work with finds and pottery. Um, and then after that, I worked for the left of the parish. And in 1997, I formed a partnership, or was asked to form a partnership uh, with the Dr. Jerry Adams, um, which is still the partnership still exists. Um, in passing, I think partnerships are something we haven't actually put by going with it in your, your list, but so um, there are certain um, legal things about partnerships which um, I think you should be aware of, not least that you're responsible for your partner, partner's um, debts. So if they run up and haven't done stuff, you can do it and it's all on you. Um, in 2000, um, both Jerry and I, uh, along with three other people, um, Dr. Hilary Cool, Dr. Peter Guest, and Peter Mould, um, formed Barber for Research Associates. Uh, this is a limited company, so this is another aspect to, um, to my uh, working life. Um, as a limited company, we don't actually employ anybody. Um, we're there really in the role of facilitators, so we, we um, bid for grants and, and um, very for the pots of money and then finish off the acts. Um, I can tell you um, all about them if you want to know at the later date. But thus far, we've published Pearsbridge, Bridge, Brew, or Wigmore Castle. Um, the other thing we're involved in is um, uh, sort of management. So, the Parker Research um, Associates is currently the manager, the only manager of the Staffordshire Board Project. So all the money for that project goes to Parker Research Associates. Um, okay, so my working life is, is divided up between looking at pottery, which I did only for many years. Um, but over the last ten, at least ten years, um, I do academic editing. Um, what else do I do? <laughs> I've forgotten. Um, oh yeah. Oh, it's at the bottom of the list. There we go. Um, so, um, project management. Um, I also write the syntheses of, of evidence. So I do various um, various things. So I'm teaching. Um, I have involvement with local societies, um, and I do think called on do a bit of pop drawing. So, there we are. Now, the most interesting thing about what I'm going to say 
probably, is that I have written in big letters, I've shown my colleague on the side, you can see here, which says inspiration. So I'm going to dovetail very neatly with what um, Matty has been saying. Um, I came at it from a slightly different direction. Um, I, I've divided it into two points which can come under the, the concept of integration. One is in the actual report writing, because nothing enrages me more than um, archaeological reports contain lists of things, um, <coughs> which I just find, um, well, they just enrage me. Um, <laughs> because at some point, I would like to see the, uh, the um, information from the animal bone and the, uh, <coughs> sorry, the finds, the pottery, integrated to my interview and some side. So, <coughs> as specialists, we are not handmaidens to feel our pilgrims. We're part of the process. Um, so, <coughs> that's my second aspect, thank you. That's my second aspect of integration. Which is there's always a problem that as long as we are in our own boxes as, as a particular kind of specialist, the easier it is to marginalise us. That's my thing. Um, and so I think we should all consider ourselves first and foremost as archaeologists and then specialising in whatever we specialise in. And it might not just, it might be more than one thing. Um, so I don't think we should see ourselves as orbiting the mighty sun that is the field archaeologist. So, so I did be in my bonnet, but there we go. Um, don't have any, any problem with field archaeologists, but it's just this. So if you say to someone, you know, um, what you do, so I, I'm a pot specialist or an archaeologist specialising in pottery. The field um, archaeologist is the only person who introduces themselves only as an archaeologist. They don't need to, um, I've got, can't think of the word, um, qualified, qualified yes. in, in, in any way at all. So um, I think that that does lead to some some problems, and it it, it why I'm why I'm sort of exercised about it is I think it leads all the way through the process into what Victoria was talking about and how specialists interact with the with the clients because um, I don't know who Victoria asked in her survey, but she actually didn't ask some of the people I work for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not to not to you, Victoria. No. So really, I think that's sort of um, all I want to say. So I've had no no formal training whatsoever in anything I do. Um, most of what I learned, I learned either when I was an employee, um, which is a um, well, it's a system, as we've already discussed, that's all, all, all but collapsed. Um, it's very difficult now to get the, the, to be as fortunate as people of my generation were in being able to travel around and you know, excavate, uh, work with various artifact classes. Uh, that's, that doesn't exist. Um, <coughs> so, on a positive note, it is possible <laughs> to learn <laughs> of your, you know, don't have to be um, taught as such, but it's when I started, it was as again we've been talking about it was possible to go to different excavations and talk to different people about their pottery in the same area and build up a picture. And the difficulty will be, I think, when it comes to pottery anyway, is, is when, you, when you leave university, you simply won't have enough background knowledge go straight into that. That isn't necessarily the case with other special ones, but it would be the case with pottery. Anyway, that's enough. That's all I have to say. Uh, I'll
afternoon. I'm John Martin. I'm currently, currently working as a freelance archaeological field worker. I've worked in archaeology for close to 20 years. The majority of that time, West archaeology. Sorry, I very seldom do this. I'll look at the reads of this. <laughs> um, I worked in archaeology for close to 20 years. The majority of that time, Wessex archaeology in Salisbury, where I was a project officer for six years until I was made redundant in 2011. Since then, I've worked on a variety of units, including PCA, South London City Unit, LP archaeology, Context One, Allen archaeology, <coughs> and started back at Wessex. In 2011, I started to take on self employed work. Well, I'd not become fully self employed until very recently. I work sometimes as a product officer, more often as a site supervisor or digger. I generally charge a flat rate of £150 a day if it's local, if I'm working as a digger, and £180 a day if I'm actually a project officer. I have one locally based client who might charge £120 a day plus travel expenses, as he's a sole trader and we work together fairly frequently. The most I've earned is £400 a day for a weekend where both the client and the archivist contractor were in dire need at very short notice. I very seldom work away from home. I can be tempted the job is very interesting or the contract is well paid, but only really for short periods of time. I can work up to an hour and a half away from my home in Ashburton, which means I can cover most of them in East Cornwall and just about in the summer. Time. <laughs> in 2013, I became a full-time single parent and moved back from Hampshire to Ashburton in Devon to be close to my family so that my sister could help me with before and after to work care for my son Charlie and we could both be close to his grandfather in 87. A bit fragile. These may seem rather unnecessary biographical details, but I think the situations I have to deal with are relevant to our discussions. To my knowledge, there are only two archaeological units based in Devon, one medium size and one small. Neither unit was interested in hiring a self employed basis or employing a tool for that matter. Neither unit was a member of the IFA. The smaller unit takes on school leave as, a, as apprentices and pays them about £12,000 a year. The director of the second larger unit had a copy of my CV, listened very attentively, we chatted amicably at length on several occasions, did not contact me once in four years. The sole trader I work for, Mark Steinmetzer, a local archaeology, does not have quite enough work to keep the two of us busy, and this means a substantial percentage of my work comes from the larger units working on the wage jobs. The field work division of most archaeological units spend a large time of their time working away, and unlike, say, construction site staff, shop fitters, utility construction workers are not in the grand scheme of things well paid. For example, I worked as an archivist on a gas pipeline project for lowest labourers, and these are the guys that put the tyres out of the machines, were well, well, only £1,000 a week, so for that sort of money to endure considerable hardships. Also, one of the contracts I spoke to could afford gaps in their employment because they were earning so much when they were working. In contrast, the archaeologists will earn their basic salary plus some travel and stay away money. Over time is rare. Which is interesting because most of the staff are going back to their lonely room in the B&B, so they're not actually doing anything when they're not on the site. Working away on the sites can be great fun, but it's not really allowed to have any sort of regular family or home life. This leads to a high attrition rate amongst field staff. They either try to move into more office space work or leave the profession. The holy grail for field staff obviously is site work close to home. There should be far more staff wanting this work than there is work available. Employment at archaeology is a very broad-based pyramid. There are many more people seeking to gain promotion or move into specialist work than there are posts available. This is why I believe that all units should try and use more self-employed field staff. It's cheaper for the employer. I pay my daily rate, but the units have to find me accommodation, pay overnight expenses, or transport me to and from the unit's headquarters or to and from site. In addition, I'm not entitled to holiday pay, sick pay, or national insurance contributions. To my advantages, the longer I work in Devon, the more I've got my knowledge of local geology, local pottery types, and general knowledge of the area, and I get to back my own house every night. Another plus for the unit having a locally based person on the team is they can be on site on Monday before the rest of the crews arrive to open up the site, sort of that plant, get things going, and they can stay on site Friday afternoon machine watching or digging when the crew has to stop early for home. Some of the larger archaeology units, hang on, pause. So, some of the larger archaeological units have opened up regional offices, which I think is a good idea. They suffer from the unpredictability of the workload. You take on 10 staff, and so there's a massive increase in work, and you're shorthanded, or unexpected projects fall through, and you have 10 staff with nothing to do. The problem is less acute than the main office, because staff members there expect to have to travel. Staff working in a regional office are usually hoping to stay in that area. A unit opened up, I'll tell this anecdote anyway, a unit opened up recently in Exeter. They took on three or four local people, 
one guy's married to wife's like 40, one guy's got three kids, and we've got a lot to work on our plastic cars in the evening. Excellent news, fantastic. Their first job was in Hull for three months. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. Speaking personally, I find that self-employment suits my particular circumstances. As a single parent, it would be very difficult to commit myself to full-time employment. As I've already mentioned, it's problematic to work away because of my family commitments. I'm also lucky, and as a single parent, I qualify for child tax credit and working tax credit, which provides me with a safety net and lean times. The fact that I can earn a reasonably good rate when I'm working means that I can cope with an every period without work. But I do think the service I offer can be mutually beneficial to myself and any prospective employer, mostly because I'm looking for lengthy contracts that we need with full-time employment. I'm quite happy to take on work on a very short-term or intermittent basis. For example, last year I only took a watching brief at Cotswold Garden and you're on a site for a solar array in Cornwall, a long way from the nearest office in Andover. The job lasted for three months, but until I turned up on Monday, the contractor could never tell me whether I was needed for a week, three days, or not to the end of the week, or next week. If you're actually travelling down from Andover, that'd be a big problem. For me, it's not so much of a headache. If project managers knew that a small number, and that a number of self-employed diggers were available in a particular area, then they would have the option of getting them signed up or having to advertise for more staff, to which they have to offer work at a specific time, i.e. Like three months or six month contracts. I'm quite happy to work on a week-to-week -week basis, and I'm not too upset with a four-week job, I end up being a three-week job. Equally, I have some leeway in the times that I work, so I like to be working less during the school work. Archaeologists often appear to have a problem talking about money, or at least looking at what they earn and compare it with other trades and professions make. Taking another dig and you earn 150, 200 pounds a day can surprise people who didn't break it down and explain what that is. But really, 150 pounds a day is less than a pretty earns. I was approached by a unit at Christmas time two years ago, it me 70 pounds a day, a princely sum. I was slightly upset when I turned them down. In the spirit of not being embarrassed about money, I can tell you the year before I became a single parent, I earned about £30,000 a year before expenses. Since then, I've grossed between £15,000 and £18,000 a year with the work's picked up. It's not a fortune, but I'm quite happy with the work life balance. I can earn more, but I think we've got less fun for Charlie and myself. The units I've worked on have also been prompt payers. I usually wait a maximum month after submitting an invoice. This compares very favourably with my previous occupation as a construction site worker. But the clients often made, often made a point of honour to hold on to money for as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> there, are a few, there are a few potential drawbacks to this way of working. As I told you earlier, I've been in archaeology for a long time and have gained a certain amount of confidence and experience of watching briefs on building sites, machine washing, site stripping and trenching. I'm like tempting fate over here, the gas main that's the wrong side, but, <laughs> but self-employment might not suit everyone just starting out in a career as a lot of time to develop their skills of working on a range of sites. Since becoming self-employed, I've undertaken a great deal of watching briefs and small-scale evaluations and excavations. Someone just starting out might want to spend a few years working on a big project for a large unit to carry out. Also, career progression is going to be a problem. I was already a project officer before I started, so it's been easier for me. I've talked to some managers who are not enthusiastic about self-employed archaeologists and offered me either full-time job or zero-hours contracts. So I realised that self-employed digger it's still a fairly rare bird, and there are obviously greater practical challenges with field staff than there are with, for example, pottery or former remain specialists. I'm going to punch them, do British archaeology does have a problem, though, with retaining experienced field staff. When times are busy, there are often staff shortages. Like buses, my work often seems to come in threes, nothing for a month, and everybody wants to start yesterday. Archaeology also for a long time was an annual influx of new graduates, trout fodder. A harsh thing to say, but true, but which many leave after two or three years, unable to cope with low levels of pay and uncertain career prospects. This is rotten for them and also bad for the profession, which some of those does not seem to appreciate the importance of well trained, experienced field staff. I'm relying here on purely anecdotal evidence. It does seem that there are less graduates coming into archaeology, and those that I chat to seem to be carrying staggering amounts of student debt. I'm aware that self-employment is not the answer to all the current problems archaeology faces. Only offers a more flexible way of working which surely be a benefit to the profession. Right, hi, I'm John Kenny, um, and a uh, bit of my context then. Um, I'm afraid I'm biology as well, so yeah. huge <laughs> amounts of it. Um, 
I started out, started out doing a actually doing business studies years ago that led me into retail, that led me into local authority housing, that led me into depression because uh, I got fed up with selling all our houses to people and not building anymore. So I like blame Margaret for that. Um, and so luckily, because I was so sulky about it, I looked saw things on TV that I thought looked interesting. So into my thirties, I went off to university, um, did archaeology at York, and then kind of uh, started another career, a kind of academic career. So I went, you know, went, in, went through degree to master's in heritage management, then did a PhD, which was purely self, um, uh, sort of uh, grandissement. You know, I wasn't, it wasn't really, I didn't really see it necessarily as a career move, but I might just stick up a few teachers who told me I wouldn't get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, um, a little bit of joy after that, although sadly. Most of them had retired and, and possibly even died by the time I'd actually completed the PhD. So <laughs> I didn't get much. But after that, I was then left with a situation of thinking, well, what, you know, I'm actually going to have to do some work. Um, and I'd already um, been working as a volunteer with the Orkham Logical Trust in, um, in Fines back in around the year 2000. Um, and I started to also want to get into some field work, so I started to form my own kind of little group to go and research a. Um, uh, a, a site near Moulton. So I had a bit of field work going along, but actually I made my money by working for the ABS. So I was a, an ABS pod, so I might have been at IFF a few years ago telling you all to jolly well archive your digital records properly. <laughs> did all those bits. Then, well, I did a bit of project management. I reached, so about you like you, I reached the pinnacle of income in the 90s with about 30 odd thousand managing a uh, heritage lottery funded project at the base of the University of New York, um, and um, uh, that, that paid me just over 30,000 a year. But uh, there was another opportunity coming, because early on um, in, in New York, there, there, was a, there was a move to try and provide support for local communities to do archaeology. So this is in 2004, um, the YAT finished up managing the project, an HLF project that has five years, and was going to support local groups to try and to try and to sort of uh, do their do their thing and, um, and learn a bit about their own historic uh, environment. And I was lucky enough after the first year to actually get the get that post. So four years, community archaeologists at York Archaeological Trust, and it was absolutely wonderful because we had, you know, the money was coming from the Heritage Lottery Fund. I could go and support. The groups with the things they wanted to do, we go and help look for, for yeah. temple of sites. So, yeah, no, absolutely time. wonderful. We had a great time. And also, I was able to try out all my um, desires to try and show that archaeology should be for other people. So, I was able to kind of make, make contacts with people with learning difficulties um, and, and do archaeology in different ways with different people. Um, and that still carries on. Mm -hmm. I work with, with learning difficulties, I still work with now. So nothing most of the time, but hey ho. Um, that was great. And then somehow, until about a year ago, I managed to remain being a community archaeologist within your Archaeological Trust, which is a, a strange and, and sort of many-headed many, many beast in York, and has at some state, sometimes actually been, um, you know, felt like it owned York, you know, had, um, had responsibilities if you found something, you had to go to YAT with it, it was like they were almost the, Sort of arbiters of what was went on, but that didn't, that was really blown out of the water by um, competitive tender. But they, they ran York at Viking Centre um, and other other um, other, other uh, sort of attractions within York, but also operated as a unit. Um, and that unit at different times has come and gone, and has did at one stage have specialists in almost all areas, I think. Um, but like, I'm not the only person here who was. Uh, who disappeared from that um, from the from that organisation at the around about the same time? There was a bit of a, a sort of a removal of people, and uh, so I went into um, went into uh, self-employment. Not because I made a decision I'm going to be self-employed, but rather I was in a position where there was a an offer of voluntary redundancy, but the same sort of role was no longer available. That makes me a little bit odd. I think amongst all the specialists here, because community archaeology, um, I think a lot of units, a lot of people say, well, that's something we all do. We all do a bit of that when, when, when we're required. We all do, we all, there's, a, there's a contract, and, it's, and we've got to do some work with, archaeo with, with um, 
uh, with the, the public will do all that. So I think lots of units would claim that oh, we'll do community archaeology. My approach had been born out of the project that I've been running, was actually trying to, to talk to local communities, work with people, get to know people, find out what they wanted to do, and then try and help them to get money to do it. Um, and that's not financially all that secure. There are a lot of kickbacks. I you know it's, it's, there's, a, there's a bit of uh, there's a bit of um, a requirement for people to actually want to run a project because you can't. I can't go and bid for money from a lottery fund, for instance. Other organisations have to do it, um, and so all I can do is help them. They almost become like some sort of dodgy character going out and grooming these groups. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you, you know, you, you, I don't think it's anything wrong. <laughs> you're working to support people to do what they want to do, which goes right back to this morning, where in some ways I'm not going around saying I'm going to sell this to you. I'm going to sell myself. I'm actually saying that for help. So there is a nice circularity there. Um, that actually, what I'm trying to do is actually trying to help people to, to do the things they want to do. But it ain't going to make an awful lot of money. So I've only been there for one year, and I don't think I'm going to hit the threshold of 10,000 income. So I couldn't do that on my own. Um, and I was, I was quite lucky because there was a couple of projects that I'd worked on within YAC that actually came to fruition just as I was leaving. So but luckily, the community said, that's all right, you can carry on being our. So I was able to go off with a bit of an order book, if you see what I mean. I'm now at the point where I'm now trying to work up new projects of my own that are no longer got any relation to what YAT are actually So it's a, it's, it's a different type of skill. What I'm doing, my client base, if you like, are oh, all these various different groups made up of different personalities. But actually, it's a vast network of people. So it's a very much a people job. And I've had to start following other routes to do things. So I found, whilst I was working with communities, the best way of actually getting to know the whole community or more of the community was actually about the schools. Because actually, a, like a community, a history group within a small village or something, is usually just a very small sector of the, of the, of the, of the, of the village population. But if you can start chatting to the, to the schools and doing workshops and things with the schools, then the children go back and tell their parents, some of their parents are farmers, they go back and say, oh, we saw this pottery. Don't we find that in our field, Dad? And from the old farmer actually turns around and says, oh, maybe you can do some field working on my field, I suppose. Now, little things like that that start getting in people. Um, all of that networking was absolutely vital to what I did. So, where we've been talking about networking, the networks for me are absolutely vital. And I was so lucky to have been able to have that time as a paid employee to develop that network, those networks. I also developed lots of skills. So, I suppose I now see myself as a field archaeologist uh, who does other things. So, Field archaeologist who tries to talk people into um, also doing the field archaeology, also an educator. So, I, because of my work with people with learning difficulties, I then started working on a heritage lottery kind of project done by the um, Workers' Education Association called the Ability that some of you may have seen, and that was on. Um, so, I covered the York area and Selby, worked with various communities and places like Selby and Goole, getting close to Hull. Quite that far, but no, you know, don't not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, But it's all networks, so it led me into having a, a chunk of income comes from education now working with the WEA. So I've got HF projects and also starting to look at can we actually do crowdfunding projects or taking a bit of a leaf out of the adventures book at a smaller level? Can we meet our aspirations with community groups by crowdfunding, which actually means then a different responsibility? Um, to uh, provide some people give you the money. So instead of jumping through the hoops for HLF, um, you're jumping through the hoops for people who put money into crowdfunding. So that's interesting ways forward. Um, and that's, you've got to be working on it all the time, I think, is trying to, when you talk about diversifying, I'm very aware that if the income continues to be a problem, then actually I might have to do bar work. Things like, I don't mind, I'm quite good at bar work, I've done it before, do it again. I'm happy with that. Had in the past gone down and worked painting the um, painting the underground. I was I qualified from stepping just stepping people's ladders all night um, at Barons Court tube station, so eventually using that angle grinder, which I was considerably quite good at. <laughs> but also it paid me loads and loads of money working nights on the tube. 
for some very tough Irish folk. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to look for all those different opportunities, those different income streams, whilst in your head, still holding good that you've got things that you're, you're, um, you're working with. And what was really important to me, I've realised, as well as actually another network. There's a professional network there that you are part of. And I think I'm part of that because of where I've worked. Um, and so there are a number of people who have worked at your Archaeological Trust or other places who I've known, like, well, I'm talking to them. There are people out there who I've known uh, through work and other things who, at different times, can be important players in, in what we do. And it's become very apparent to me when, when having an extension built in our house, so we still managed to get the money to put an extension in the house, that, that the way the builder worked was to say, I'm a builder, but I, when it's time to do some plastering, I, I've got a guy I work with who's a plasterer. The plasterer is a self-employed plasterer, he's not employed by the builder. The builder is his own self-employed person, um, and then the electrician is, and in fact, what he does is he puts a team together of people to deal with the job that's in hand. Now, I reckon that you could put quite a good team together of people um, from around York who are self-employed now to do larger projects. None of them have quite come to fruition yet, but they are out there. Um, and um, it would be quite interesting to try putting together this idea of teams. I haven't really gone as far as actually creating any sort of overarching um, identity. But I think that that would be possible to do. So you're not even working as a formal partnership. You're actually working as a bunch of self-employed people. But with um, modern uh, communication technology, you can put yourself together so that you can offer a service with an overarching name even. Um, you don't need to con people into thinking that you know, they're dealing with one organisation and therefore they've got insurance issues and things like that. You have to sort that out. But you can work as teams to come together, do things, and then go your own way after that. So I think networks are a really, really important part of being, um, being self-employed. I should say also, just going back to, it is an important part, I think, of, tri of the work-life balance then. And it, if, I was, if we were standing up and talking about professional, other professions, you wouldn't even talk about your family. Family is outside work. My wife's just gone back to work, working part time, and between us, that's how we managed to make and survive by more than one of us putting into the family income. But where she is at work, the employers there, they don't, they don't understand why. Why do you have to get off early to don't pick the kids up? Surely, you know, that's surely you've got something in place for that. Whereas I'm able to do those sorts of things, but I still have to, you know, say to people, can we meet at 10 o'clock at night? Works all right. Community land a bit because quite a lot of people are not too worried about getting up there. But you know, then have to go at two o'clock to come pick the kids up. Or my wife has to take half a day today so that I can be here. Things like that. And you don't normally talk about that. But I think when you're self employed, you have to talk about the bigger picture. Um, and, but there's also, it's, it's wonderful going, being yeah. there, standing in the playground, picking your kids up, and that sort of thing. I love it. So there's lots of positive to, um, to self-employment. Hello, I'm Oliver Jessup, and I'll give you a very quick introduction to, I suppose, my archaeological background and talk about my work. So, just to give you some context, I joined the Young Archaeologist Club at age 11, and, <laughs> I don't know, 30 years later, I'm still doing archaeology. So, I went to Durham, did a degree in archaeology, specialised in um, start buildings, but while at Durham I did archaeological illustration, I published the typology of many arrowheads, so I did a bit of specialist work then. I then went to York to the Masters in start buildings, so I specialised in buildings archaeology. Then I went to work for National Trust, so I worked in Buckinghamshire at Stowe Garden, so a very large landscape garden, and got involved in the restoration process really, so that was recreating the 18th century landscape, looking at the buildings, but also the field work in the ground. So we took the path network and any other sort of archaeological aspects went with that. I then realised that maybe archaeology wasn't for me, and I went to Edinburgh. And I went to work with the Royal Bank of Scotland, but after about a month I realised that wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I stayed there for a year and got some experience of working for a large organisation. I spent half my time in Edinburgh, half my time in London. I hated the job, but I really enjoyed the experience of just travelling around and seeing how other organisations can work. It's really valuable. I then went to work for, I went back to archaeology, I went to Arcus in Sheffield, and I set up a buildings recording team there. And about seven or eight years ago, when there was lots of work, we had about four or five people just recording site buildings, and it was a fantastic time, and did some great projects. 2009, Arcus closed down, I then went to Wessex Archaeology, and basically we took on all the Arcus contracts, and I was a senior project manager, so it was Wessex for two and a half years, and I realised really, I've always had this desire to work myself. My father was self-employed as an architect. So I made a leap, decided to sort of resign, a good job. And 2002, no, 2012, um, February, I started working myself. So I became a sole trader. I had the experience of archaeology. I worked as a project manager. I knew about tendering for work. I knew about leading clients as authority curators. I had a background in archaeology, buildings. I thought, what's the problem? Let's just go and do it. I saved about £5,000. I resigned, and I think three or four days into this new experience, I was in York, I was looking at the river, it was very black and dark, and I thought, what have I done? I'm all good work. What am I going to do? It just seems a black hole, I've just jumped into nothing. Four years later, I now have far too much work, and I'm now, in the last year I've been a limited company, so I'm an employee for last year. As a sole trader, you're liable for everything. If it goes wrong, people can come after you, your house, that's it. Um, as a limited company, as long as the company is managed in a professional manner with accountants and you do things sort of above board, there is a limited liability there if things did go wrong. But I'm now an employee, so I pay PAY each month. And at the end of the financial year, which you just had, the company will pay corporation tax. And it's a very different way of working. When you're a sole trader, you have to save up all your tax and pay it at the end of the year. You then also have to pay half the year tax for next year. So managing your finances is very important. And having a business bank account, I found really critical. And this was quite tricky to test up initially, but it meant I could demonstrate well, money for the business is there, money for me is here, which is so that money came out into my sort of personal uh, current account. So, working for yourself, I'd recommend it and say it's the right thing to, for me to have done, but it has been really hard work and it's not a nine to five job. It's uh, you work whenever. I still work at one o'clock last night um, because I had to get something out this morning. But then two days ago, I went for a walk in the sunshine and it was fantastic. So your life balance does change and you have a lot of freedom and flexibility, which does come at a price. But one of the things I would say is, I'm not very good with receipts and finances, so a bookkeeper and accountant are essential. I made a mistake at the start of going to a medium-sized accountant because I joined the Chamber of Commerce and that's what they recommended. Actually, you don't need to do that. They were very expensive. They were trying to charge me about £100 a month just to run my accounts for the year. So by going to a small accountant, I now pay £400 a year. And I get phone and advice whenever I need it, and it's really, really useful. But it's only by making those mistakes that I've gone along that I've sort of learned from that process. But the other thing I've had to do is I've got, I think it's, a million pounds um, public liability insurance, uh, one million professional liability, 10 million public liability, and 10 million employer's liability insurance. So that's about 1,500 pounds a year just in insurance. I'm a member of the IFA, which has a cost, full corporate member. I'm a registered organisation as well, so that's another five, 600 pounds a year just to have those accreditations. So in order for me to trade and actually try and stand up and say, I'm an archaeologist, this is what I do. There's this whole sort of background costs which I have to sort of pick up. So that's when it comes down to rates and what do you charge. On paper, I have the same accreditations as some very large archaeological companies. 
okay, essentially I work by myself and I bring in subcontractors and specialists to do the projects. I'm going to do all sorts of projects all over the country, um, not just historic buildings, I do lots of landscape surveys. Um, and I'm working with people who are very good at what they do, and can put together a team and deliver sort of quite exciting projects. So just to sort of say again that don't be cheap as chips. You have a value and you've got to charge for that. And people will get to just they'll accept that. And as a specialist, if you charge £200 pounds a day, great. Sometimes you can charge £300 pounds a day. It just depends what you're doing. But don't be the same I think it's really important. And then you can't do everything. Um, I've made mistakes and had to take on too much work because you don't want to say no. You don't know where the next job's coming from. And I think the first two or three years, I was always worried about that. Where's the, what's the next project? I think now I've started to forget that. I worry about other things. So maybe I'm getting older as well. Um, but yes, you don't know what's coming next. When you're in, a, in employment with an organisation, it's great. You go to work, you come home with it. So it's just sort of thoughts really about my experience. Um, QA, I write reports. When you get so intense on doing something, sometimes it's useful to a second pair of eyes to look at what you've done. So I get my reports checked. So Amanda, looking over there, is now my editor. And she does a great job. But before Amanda, I've used someone else to sort of check my work for two or three years. And it's just knowing that there's another pair of eyes looking at what you've done. Because what we write often goes as a, comes a planning document. And someone's paying for that professional advice. And you don't want to look an idiot. Because if you've got something wrong, it's nice to know beforehand. So, for me, as I said earlier on, I work all over the country, and sat nav has been really useful. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's a good sat nav. Websites are very good. Websites are a shop window. So, there's all sorts of websites you can get out there. But imagine it's a shop window, and it's a way of selling yourself. And people can come and look at it, and it's just a very simple way now of getting your your name out there. And it's not just about having sort of the archaeological skills and knowledge to do archaeology. It's having a bit of understanding about the business side of it. And for me, I've learned that as I've gone along. Um, I said I've got a bit of experience working in a bank, but it is a, a turbulent process sometimes, and you will make mistakes, but you do have to keep going. And um, I would sort of recommend working yourself. That's it. It's good to do it with other people. I'll go on my